the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we are here today with Common Cry, who is the editor, chief, chief, Writer? Well, one of the editors and secretary general. Secretary general, thank okay. you, of NukeNet, uh, one of the world's leading nuclear uh, publications. Welcome to the podcast. Well, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak. Um, I see that uh, probably many people s said, you know, important things in this podcast before me, but I think uh, I'll give some of my uh, insights to the industry as well. Um, so. Well. We are very excited to, to get all those insights. But before we sort of dive into the industry, let's learn a little bit about you. Uh, can you tell us sort of uh, how you got into to journalism, what sort of predated that experience, and how you got to nuclear? Well, it, it, it was really, um, it was not a designed uh, career path that uh, I, you know, uh, set, set upon by, you know, uh, you know thinking of where I should be going in, a, in my career development is just kind of uh, happened uh, by chance in a way, you know. Um, my uh, education background is in uh, business administration and then uh, actually European politics. In, uh, from, uh, I have a degree from uh, um, Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. Um, and I never thought I would end up in uh, energy and less even in nuclear energy. Um, it's just that you know i i applied for this uh this position as a junior first uh it was now seven years ago a little bit less than that um so and, before yeah. that though how did you get into journalism well i i ended up being a journalist exactly when i entered nuknet before that i was not really a journalist oh, wow. i was just uh, doing financial uh you know uh financial transfers for uh, for a couple of years and then uh well, you know, in a way, I, I did a bit of blogging in between, changing jobs, and I've always had a, a, well, a really, I would say, strong interest in uh, in politics rather than energy so much. But you know, the, you know, the relationship with, between energy and politics, of course, has always been there. So um, I always had this humanitarian, I would say, um, uh, mind, and uh, and I, I just started to. You know, as a as a as a blogger would do nowadays, or year, a few years ago, I just said, okay, I, I know a few things I might want to speak about, maybe about my uh, home region of uh, Eastern Europe at the beginning, and uh, you know, I did a bit of blogging, and this actually helped me to to move into into the new net position because I, I was able to go and say, guys, listen, uh, I can write. I mean, I did. I, I was uh, all my studies were in English. I did a couple of you know, <laughs> a lot of papers in English. So I said, okay, I, I think I have this the sufficient uh, capability to do this sort of job and I just landed in in nuclear and I never thought it's going to be really permanent but now I look back at it and it's already quite some years that passed and to be honest I uh, I think if I didn't like it I would have left um, but yet I am still here and um, you say journalism but for us it's very specific because you know in the general journalistic mindset nowadays is uh, it's probably a bit different than what we do because we really focus on the on the factology in the in the industry on all these developments that you know the general public would probably not find interesting you know mm -hmm. um so i am not always 100 percent sure how to refer to myself when uh, people say what i what i do and uh, i say uh, journalist but at the same time we do a lot of uh, you know communication in between uh, industry st uh, stakeholders and it's not really the journalist that you imagine you know, running with the microphone and 
and uh, speaking to to people about uh, about uh, various topics it's really really uh, specific for us you know yeah so one thing at least i know when i sort of came to nuclear because i also come from a non-nuclear non-technical background mm -hmm. was that i felt like i really needed to get myself up to speed on a lot of these terms and concepts that maybe i i didn't understand what was that experience like for you just trying to familiarize yourself with an industry you had not previously worked in yeah well i to, to be honest i i never for example uh, i never really had a, an issue with nuclear power so for me nuclear power was, was always a um something that i mean in my own in my own uh, home country i didn't mention it but i i come from uh, from bulgaria i lived a lot of years uh, i mean overseas already but um nuclear power was always there i mean since i remember myself and since i was growing up as a as a teenager or a, an adult later it was always there so it was never something we questioned um, it was never something I was opposed to and uh, and that's why uh, I, I, I I found this to be just uh, a job as any other or uh, just uh, I thought at the beginning it could be an entry point to energy in general because I thought okay maybe there's there's more uh, more work to do with uh, you know, gas or some other uh, you know more more uh, more you know I want to. I, I would not say prominent industries, but probably um, easier to 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 chew on for most people, you know. Um, but yet, I, I find uh, nuclear to be quite interesting, and it's it's an it's like a niche market for us, and it's uh, it's something that is in a way unique because not many people do that, and not many people know stuff about it, and not many people have the 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 um, compendium of, uh, of of knowledge about it because uh, you we over the years collect a lot of uh, knowledge about different aspect aspects of the industry that you know help you connect the dots in the end you know um so yeah i mean that's it as yeah. far as it goes so, for my motivation yeah so um can you kind of walk us back a little bit and talk about how nuknet was founded sort of what the inspiration was and, and what the growth has been like over the years yeah that's a good topic um Okay, well, NukeNet was founded back in 1991 or 1990. Oh. So, so it's yeah, it's 30 years. But uh, you know, if, of course, you have to uh, imagine that the world looked different back then, and uh, I think that's of course way be, be before my time. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I know from uh, th there are some colleagues with us that still still uh, are with us from from those years. Wow. So actually, I, I listen to their background stories and whatever I say now is things th the things that have been told mm -hmm. to me by uh, by people who are with us still um, the idea was at the beginning for the nuclear industry to have some sort of uh, independent communication uh, agency or organization which could uh, separate the facts from the mythology around nuclear power because this was the aftermath of the of the Chernobyl disaster, of course, uh, and then a lot of uh, the European uh, industry stakeholders at the time they they sat down and said, okay, we we, we have all this like media noise and we, we we need somebody to 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 get out there and and clean it up, you know, and say, okay, this this is true, this is not, and there was more engineering expertise at the time, and uh, things of course evolved, uh, you know, they were sending faxes back then. Mm -hmm. Now it's now we are of course doing the work online and you know, newsletters and all this sort of stuff. We don't have a print edition. You know, I think they uh, never had a print edition. But um, uh, the idea was uh, for exactly exactly to 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 make sure that uh, the anti-nuclear sentiment doesn't creep into journalism, creating uh, you know some sort of uh, paradigm of negativity about nuclear power and uh, and and and. and of course, things changed over the years because uh, we were first in Switzerland, then they moved to, to Belgium. Then, of course, many times they changed addresses and stuff. And um, ultimately, we, we reached a point where nuclear NukeNet at the moment is a typical, I would say, trade uh, press agency where we follow the industry uh, and the industry follows us in a way. I think most of our readership is, uh, is among the nuclear uh, stakeholders. Um, not so much probably the general public uh, yet we we managed to find our way and still be around our, after so many years um, we we had a model where you know there were mostly uh, large nuclear stakeholders that that were uh, 
technically providing our readership. But over the last couple of years, already under my helm, I, I see that we are moving into a direction where we, we also started to see individuals coming in the picture as uh, filling in the readership and then there are people who are probably a little bit already outside the nuclear industry. Um, it's, it's really like nascent, so I'm not going to say that this is the, 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 you know, that it's really game changer for us, but we are still widely read by the industry. But I can see that uh, the, the website, for example, is really visited probably by a wider public, yeah. while the newsletter still remains to be very specifically uh, niche. Um, but we we had to adapt to the environment and you know we had to be fully online we have to do, go on of course on social media at one point uh, and we did everything that uh, you know the general m online media trend requires you know mm -hmm. so uh, i think we we are in a good position today to say as you said that we're one of the um, couple of leading uh, you know organizations in the in the sector um so yeah if if any more questions, of course. Yeah, yeah. so um, lots of questions kind of about yeah, sure. all your processes. <laughs> but um, one thing that kind of comes top of mind is, um, you know, especially, I think you probably have a really unique view of how the industry has evolved over the past seven years or so. And, and there has been so much movement, especially with these sort of new SMR technologies constantly emerging. How do you sort of keep your finger on the pulse of who the new and up and coming you know, vendors or, or um, players in the space are and and how that that has been changing and how just sort of the, the nuclear industry has, has evolved so much so recently. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen I've seen uh, things changing uh, because when we um, when we first uh, when I first entered the, 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 the you know, the sector and the job, I, uh, I think there was less less social media work for sure you know mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, less uh, communicators involved in this um, and I, I saw this really expanding and there were a lot of industrial uh, events and discussions about uh, communication and how to do it and what to do better and how to use how to use uh, modern modern tools you mm -hmm. know um, and I still think that at that point, there, there was some sort of t timidity, I think is the word, like there was some sort of, uh, um, you know, because of the, the trauma of the past from the nuclear industry was probably afraid to speak about, to, mm -hmm. to speak up in general, to speak up and, and find its place in the in the energy uh, paradigm in, uh, in, in the world. Uh, and of course, Fukushima in 2011 didn't help either, you know. Uh, then they were a little bit, I think communication departments were always a bit shy to, to speak and to, to reach out to a general public. But I saw that changing and I still I, I, I see now that the industry has become more confident to take its position. Um, uh, companies are communicating really about the importance of nuclear, which is I think it's good. Um, they found the they found out that in the innovation is a, is a buzzword they want to speak about and they found out that they want to show the public that nuclear is not just stuck in the past and there are new projects that are coming our way. And, you know, as any other industry, it has also evolved and it is evolving and it's, you know, the reactors we will have today or in 10 years are not the same that we used to have back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so more to, to, to the point, I would say that from, uh, from our perspective as, as in Nuknet, as, as uh, editors and people who are doing this daily, I can tell you that the, uh, exactly the innovation topic and the SMR topic is something that people really like, that this, mm -hmm. this you know, the views of the, these stories and then when these stories go on social media you have a few times more engagement or uh, impressions or, or all sorts of like positive stats than the what you get on average you know mm. so we know that um, there is some sentiment around around uh, SMRs for sure about uh, innovation about uh, new build projects in general um, if it's about new build, people also like to read it. I guess they like to see that nuclear is, is going somewhere, that it's not stuck. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when there are failures, also we report on that. We don't hide this. You know, right. we have to. If there is an honest communication about something that has gone okay or has gone not okay, we have to say it. You know, because that's our uh, that's our uh, policy at Nuknet. But uh, I can see that. Uh, the audience is hungry for for progress you know mm -hmm. so that's 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 something that uh, 
was not there five six years ago I, that that's my impression of course maybe uh, maybe i'm wrong maybe it's just a partial view but uh yeah no i think i mean at least in our sort of independent tracking of nuclear journalism i've definitely noticed a major uptick in the last nine months or so of major global publications writing more and more, yeah. more, and more about nuclear. Yeah. Like, I think the Wall Street Journal writes about nuclear yeah. pretty regularly now. Um, you know, we see it in, in Bloomberg quite a bit, and that's been, been pretty amazing. I think, you know, we thought maybe some of that was spurred by Bill Gates really becoming a little bit more publicly supportive of nuclear, and, and so that got it on people's minds, and then people got more into it. But um, I guess, do you see that as a trend, and are, are there other things that you think are informing that? That's a good point. I, sh I should have mentioned, perhaps. But yeah, I, I also we also had the impression that since the summer, for example, maybe a little bit earlier, as you say, nine months, nine to six months, we are technically getting overwhelmed by uh, by the amount of uh, developments that we have to report on. You know, we never used to have a huge backlog of stories, and now we do. So we reached a level where uh, we have to decide what is going to go out because we didn't want to, we never really want to spam mm -hmm. people. But I think we need to change a little bit the, the policy as well because we have to make choices between good good development. So we have to say this one is going to be published tomorrow mm -hmm. and this one is going to be published today, but they're all good. You know, and imagine for us, it's not like one story a week. It's like right. daily and daily and daily. So yeah. we, we need to follow all that and we, we need to... Uh, to um to be able to 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 handle that and and then and we were wondering in the team what's going on we were wondering whether this is exactly because some uh, major figures are speaking about nuclear or maybe was it because of the energy price uh, crisis in europe because it really yeah. came to be kind of ugly yeah exactly your car or, or COP yeah. that came and, you know, the, maybe the build up to COP and everybody wanted to communicate or they had deadlines for, you know, certain projects just to come before that. Or maybe, I hope, it's going to be a trend that will remain with yeah, us. And, sure. and also in the European scene, you see that, uh, the, you know, leading countries like France finally took a position in, in, in defense of nuclear power, um, which probably gave a boost to some to speak up, maybe... Uh, Mm, maybe it's the fact that uh, the European Union has been really discussing this uh, green financing right. taxonomy for some time, and the decision, the time to make a decision has come, and it's, yeah. it's also pumping the exactly. pumping, heating up the discussion. Um, I think it's too early to say whether this is going to be with us as a trend for the next year, but um, I, I've noticed that things have. Uh, yeah. Like uh, yeah. heated up, you and know, they expanded. Well, congratulations! I mean, that's so great that you have so much, so much content to write about. Yeah, on one thing is, it's, it's no. The worst is not to have. Yeah. You know, so um, we we are happy. We are happy, but exactly. Uh, exactly. We shouldn't be complaining for more work. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you find that from a looking at it, just the communications challenges around nuclear? Do you find that maybe uh, the way? issues are communicated or perceived uh, differs based on you know geographic region or the, the populations that you're communicating to do you find that you know some some regions maybe are, are more accepting of, of, of nuclear but critical of the cost and maybe some are more worried about safety or sure of course um, I think it's one of the challenges for uh, for the industry uh, advocates and I mean advocates in uh, NGO sense and also in the government and maybe in industrial sense as well um, because the different regions in the world and the different countries in those regions have different specificities on the okay. ground yeah. so it's it's very difficult for uh, for a united communication message of course there are several tiers and levels of communication you can agree on a general message about the climate but if you go down to the ground, you will see that uh, the concerns of, uh, of countries are different. The views on nuclear, are, you know, you, you don't have to go far to see what's going on in Europe, you know, with Germany and, and, uh, and uh, you know, most of Eastern European countries, for example, Central European. What to, that's how they should be referred to now. Um, want to stick to nuclear power, want to build more nuclear power. Um, you can see differences in public opinion. You c I, I can tell you that in my own country, for example, uh, nuclear was always an element of uh, even a sort of a national pride in a way that, uh, you know, 
you have this sort of technology that is reserved to an elite club and mm -hmm. you can see that some of the developing countries in the world have the same attitude to nuclear yeah. power today they want to join this uh, this elite club of uh, you know countries that have this harness this energy yeah. to produce electricity while others have their doubts about it others have moved on and they have other visions on uh, on, on how this should develop but this all requires different communication so right. So it's, that's why it's difficult to have one message, and sometimes also politically there is difficult there are difficulties to 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 reach an agreement as well. Because imagine that you know the, all politicians have constituents, and, exp and those constituents have expectations. Um, remote regions have different needs than the regions in the core of uh, Europe or the, or the United States or, or Canada. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not an easy job, and and I think it's a, I I still think it's a job for for communications professionals, yeah. and this is not always maybe understood correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. Um, you cannot just do half of it. You, know, you have mm -hmm. to. If you want to do it, you have to do it uh, fully, and you know have a strategy about it, and, and go because others do it. Other industries, then and. and other other energy industries do that uh, and and if you want to you know we all say that we are partners but we are not always yeah but there's competition within energy too so you want to play that that game you have to you have to really put up the resources yeah behind, exactly you, know? you, you really need to sort of staff up at the same level as the other you know energy sources right i mean if you look at something like oil and gas there there is so much power behind the pr and the marketing and the branding yeah. in that industry uh, that it just, I mean, that really, they really push their own narrative. They create their own narrative. And it seems like the nuclear industry maybe lets other people create their narrative and just apologizes for it when there's, they really shouldn't be. Well, yeah, as, as I said, it, we, there was some sort of, uh, you know, uncertainty or whether they should really go so much at, uh, at edit and then, you know, and, and communicate about the place nuclear should be taking, you know, because they were always afraid that they would be criticized about, you know, the past failures mm -hmm. or, or the, you know, the cost, the upfront cost, because this is, you know, this is something that scares people, you know, like mm -hmm. upfront cost cap, the capex at the beginning, that's high, but then of course it gets cheaper. After 30 years, you don't, you know, technically it's only profitable, you know, it operates for so many years. People don't think about it. Politicians probably have short term, um, you know, how politics operates in, in terms and, uh, um, so yeah, yeah. No, I, I think also. I mean, that sort of misunderstanding. I think just a lot of people maybe have a fundamental misunderstanding of the role nuclear plays as an energy source, and as a as a journalist, that can really hurt you because it can sort of impact the way you're able to report on that on that subject if you fundamentally don't understand it. And and maybe you know, as more people start to look into these topics and start to be able to read sources that uh, you know from a very sort of non-biased uh, background or are able to report on what's actually happening, uh, you know, other journalists will be able to sort of inform themselves and say, maybe I misunderstood this and maybe I should be approaching this from a more, you know, objective uh, a view. Well, one of the, I think, I, I don't want to speak for journalists, but, you know, in general, but I think, I think we have a, bit of an issue with modern journalism and that's uh, time constraint or maybe mm -hmm. the amount of volume that For people sure. are faced with uh, and I would say there are not so many publications publications who, who have remained I, I'm not saying we're perfect no we're just very specific so for us it's just a small volume that you know it's channeled in a in, in a very constrained uh, environment mm -hmm. so we don't really stray out but you can see that the, the general journalism, when they touch upon energy topics, and especially nuclear energy, there is really a lack of understanding, as you say. And, and it's not to blame the journalists because it's, it took me years to also get into this. Right. And it's a complex thing. For and sure. um, and you can see that, and I, we are, I myself, when I am, I'm still, you know, doing editorial work and, uh, and, and I have issues to, to explain complex nuclear stuff in mm -hmm. simple terms right and then sometimes you have to really i mean we try to well we're probably blessed because we know that the people who read us actually know a bit of the background mm -hmm. or a lot of the background so we don't have to explain every single thing but if you're uh, if you're writing about uh, nuclear and you have to explain it to general public um where do you how do you decide what is important and what to to leave out if yeah. you t talk about projects and their 
and their past and right. it's you know you, you if you go out and say everything then it's it's you, just you, can't you, make, you write a you book can't about write an essay, it yeah. exactly so it's it's tough and um sadly i think there is a lot of uh, this type of ha hashtag mentality that people have mm -hmm. and they want to pick up something that they can hashtag and they can throw as a you know put some buzzwords in it and throw it yeah. out and uh and they also pre probably know what the audience expects and they just tailor the, the content to the audience. Yeah. Um, and if you know that you're led, uh, read by anti-nuclear uh, people, then maybe you want to put a bad light on nuclear. I mean, I'm, first of all, I don't believe in completely unbiased journalism in general. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I have yeah. to say that. That's my opinion. You know? um, I don't think we are completely unbiased either with being in this sector. And, you know, I mean, I mean self, I myself, I don't have a problem with nuclear power, you know, if it has, as I said, if there are problems, we will report them, but I still wish good to the industry, you see? Yeah. So I'm not either uh, unbiased, I would say, but um, the, the problem is when you see that some journalists don't do at all the, the background check and they actually write stuff which is not true, you know? Right. And I'm not going into controversial topics about how many people died from Chernobyl, how many were impacted and so on and so on, you know? Um, even more more simple uh, recent developments about uh, projects, you know, saying that something is more expensive compared to another thing, making a statement, but just don't you don't explain, for example, that in the case of uh, nuclear power, you, you have facilities that will be operated for 80 years, mm -hmm. while in the case of wind, you have facilities that will be operated for 25 years, right. you know. So when you omit that, you omit an important piece of information, people cannot, you know, you, you, you're not the one to give a statement and say that's better, that is not. Right. But you have to say that this costs that much, this costs that much, this is going to be operated that much, and this is going to be operated that much. And, and then when people read that and get this information, they can judge and say, okay, so maybe it's not such a good idea to do this, or maybe, okay, after all, um, we have to think about it. Or, you know, um, you, you have to strive to give the full picture uh, as, as, as good as you can. Uh, because if you omit, it's not a lie, but it's still um, skewing the picture, you For see? Sure, exactly. Um, you need to be able to have all the information to make a, a, an informed judgment. And if the choice is against nuclear, fair enough. If the choice, the choice is uh, pro-nuclear, it's also fair enough. You know? But you need to give people the info and not select it. Right, exactly. Making the decision based on you know, good journalism practices and not, yeah. you know, I, I feel this way about an issue. You know, that, that, that very much makes sense. And do you think that maybe the answer is, is somewhat lies in kind of what we were talking about before and in, in the uh, sort of way as like a society we, we learn about nuclear relative to other energy sources and, and maybe if, you know, communications professionals were sort of taking on this challenge of trying to create, you know, more equitable conversations about energy in, in general and, and different sources of energy, maybe that could sort of permeate its way into journalism and, and other conversations around these issues. I, I hope so, you know, um, to be honest, in my experience, when I go to, to um, when I've been to, to, to press, press briefings about uh, nuclear, specifically called by industry or other stakeholders, you still see that there is just a, a few of us from the trade press, mm -hmm. my colleagues from other organizations that are sitting there and a few general journalists. So. I still think that there is a lack of uh, general interest and uh, I think most of uh, um, journalists will not come to an event which is uh, branded as nuclear, mm -hmm. sadly. Um, and I still think that that should not be discouraging people uh, and, and they should still talk about it and talk about it because nowadays you need to establish your presence digitally and everywhere so you need to be present the industry needs to go out and speak maybe to to all venues at all venues possible and uh, and make sure that when there are uh, people from other industries nuclear is also there uh, and we uh, maybe the idea is to get people used to the fact that nuclear is around you know um, but you know you have to imagine that it's difficult to fight uh, negative uh, images so once or twice stigmatized mm -hmm you have to mount an enormous effort to technically take down that stigma and then move forward and you know um, 
there is a generational thing as well because you, you see people back in the 90s after Chernobyl and they they were people who were who mounted on the you know they they, they went on the path of uh, of, uh, of you know this uh, environmentalism and it, it, you know envir environment environmentalism also developed over the the decades but people young back then made uh, you know the removal of nuclear power an important uh, you know life goal and now they're in their later years and they are already maybe politicians and they they they, they have to speed back on what they and their work and they say okay now actually nuclear power is good um it's not it's not going to to work and um so this stigma still lives with these with with a lot of these people who are back back then young you know mm -hmm. uh and and they still carry these messages and very few of them have changed and they might have also reproduced this stigma to people who theoretically uh were you know like most of them born after chernobyl or you know maybe they were very young when fukushima happened maybe they were not even conscious when fukushima happened so you know teenagers today or right. um and this thing is somehow perpetually recreated and i i still don't completely see how 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 good we have gone out of this you know yeah. uh but i still think that it's better to speak about it as much as we we can and 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 fight for the soul of uh of of, uh, of, of people still um it's not going to be quick it's not going to be quick for sure no that that makes total sense um so kind of as we're wrapping up here you know we're we're here at the, the world mm -hmm. nuclear exhibition today uh how has your experience been what have you been doing here and kind of what are you looking forward to well, I um, normally start by just walking out and, you know, ma mapping everybody who's here to see, you know, people have an offer and who's, who's represented. Um, I uh, will have a couple of interviews. I had a couple of interesting meetings uh, with, you know, people I, uh, you know, normally contact beforehand. Um, and, you know, such venues are interesting for us in the sense that, you know, we are also... Uh, we're looking to expand as as uh, as, uh, as an organization or to expand our readership base. So, if the industry reads that here is the industry, so we see okay who potentially can be um, uh, using our services in a way as well. So it's uh, there is a <laughs> commercial element to all this as well. But I uh, always take the, the opportunity to have one or two interviews at least on the sidelines or uh, you know do some reporting on from the keynote speeches and so on. So we create some content for for uh, for Nuknet, but. Um, I think I, it's, it's the third time I have come and I, I like this venue because you have everything in one place and you see guys I, I could meet you I would yeah. probably never uh, otherwise uh, um, you know, meet you in person like this or uh, you know it, it would take uh, more organization yeah. more organization yeah. to do so you know so um, yeah I, I welcome this and uh, I think next uh, time which I think should be 2023 so it's two years from now I think we will probably get our own uh, boot, you know, uh, because I think it's uh, it's it's good to to establish this uh, this presence. And as for nuclear in general, the more such events, the more talk about nuclear, the better it is. So uh, I think it's uh, it's it's uh, it's good that we are here. Well, we will look forward to seeing you in 2023 at the, uh, the next WNE. Thank you so much for joining us today on Titans of Nuclear. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure as well. And uh, thanks very much for the attention. Um, hope to uh, see you soon. Anybody, if you want to speak to me, you know how to find me. So. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.